my name is Steve Brockton. I'm director of Thousand Oaks Library, and I'm just delighted to welcome each of you here to this splendid evening that we have ahead of us. Uh, it's going to be just just delicious. There are so many wonderful things happening. Um, before we I, I introduce our, our speakers, though, I do want to acknowledge a few people in the audience. Um, first of all, I'm delighted to introduce our Mayor Pro Tem, Dr. Tom Glancy, just recently re-elected. Let's acknowledge Tom. And from our Park Board, George Lang. George, would you stand up, please? The Park Board is our landlord, so we always, always appreciate having them around. And, um, okay, now I'd like to ask uh, all the members of the Thousand Oaks Library Foundation to stand, please. Would you all stand? Thank you very much. And, and special attention, please, to Francis Prince, the president, and Tony Hagopian, who's the chair of this evening's event. And he didn't stand up, but I'd like him to anyway. Frank Brzee is an honorary member of our Library Foundation. Frank, would you stand, please? <laughs> now, the Foundation has asked me to invite each of you to a reception afterwards. We have some wonderful desserts. We have uh, some coffee. Rumor has it there's wine also. So we'd love to have you join us for that when we're finished. And in the radio world, I guess you can do that. Just throw your <laughs> okay, now, now, the genesis for this evening came about over lunch with, with Norman and, and Tony and I several months ago. We just got to, all these discussions and lunches are wonderful because we just romp through fields of discourse and just have a delightful time. And in the course of this, um, uh, Norman Lear's name came up. And we just got to thinking about not only was this man a true pioneer in television, but his legacy lives on through his Norman Lear Center at University of Southern California. So we uh, just got to talking about it and decided that an evening like this would be just a, a wonderful evening to acknowledge um, Norman's work, Norman's work, and Marty's, Marty's work as well. I'll introduce each of them in just a minute, but it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. and. Um, it's going to be a delightful evening, I know. <laughs> okay, now, I'm, I'm just delighted to introduce our, our speakers. First, uh, always first and foremost, Norman Corwin. Not only considered to be, but without a doubt is, the greatest writer, director, and producer, not only of radio's golden age, but of, of many decades beyond that. Um, many of you know that he was asked by President Roosevelt to write a piece ahead of time commemorating the end of, of World War II. The result of that assignment was a piece called On a Note of Triumph, which was played um, on all four national radio networks, the day after VE Day, it had 60 million people heard that broadcast. It was the largest broadcast, broadcast audience of any medium by anyone at any time in history up to that time. And that, I think, is, is remarkable. The same thing happened with his Ode to the Bill of Rights. We hold these truths, and that remains a cultural landmark. He's written the screenplay for Lust for Life, the film biography of Vincent Van Gogh, starring Kirk Douglas. He was a mentor to Ray Bradbury and remains one of our national treasures. So please welcome again, Norman Corwin. Now, I'm, I'm pleased to remind you that the library you're in right now, the Thousand Oaks Library, houses the Norman Corwin archives. And we're very proud of that. It's really the cornerstone of the American Radio Archives, which is um, something that we're very, very proud of. And we appreciate all that Norman has done to, to help us with that, uh, with that archive. Okay, now, I'm equally honored to introduce to you Marty Kaplan. We just had a chance to, to visit a little bit for the first time. Very impressive man. Uh, I was, as I was reading his biography, I mean, you talk about one end to the other. His, 
He graduated summa cum laude from Harvard with a degree in molecular biology, was president of the Harvard Lampoon, um, then received a first in English from Cambridge University, and um, um, got a PhD in modern thought and literature from Stanford. So to go from molecular biology to, to something like that, for someone like me, is unthinkable. It just, it just uh, uh, couldn't happen, but we're, we're delighted. He's also been chief White House speechwriter, working with Vice President Mondale. He was recruited by Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg to work for Disney as a studio vice president and writer-producer. Currently, he's executive director of the Norman Lear Center at the University of Southern California, where he holds the Norman Lear Chair in Entertainment, Media, and Society. Please welcome Martin Kaplan. Now, I'll, I'll get off the stage in just a moment, but I do want to acknowledge someone who's with us tonight, uh, very much a centerpiece of what we're doing this evening. Um, uh, we all know his, his pioneering role in television producing. His role continues in his Norman Lear Center at University of Southern California. Would you please acknowledge and welcome Norman Lear? Norman, would you stand please? He didn't want me to do that, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> okay, now, it's enough of me. Uh, no more need be said. Uh, these gentlemen can say it all. Marty Kaplan, Norman Corwin. One day, when I was a kid in East Boston, I tuned in WNAC, the Shepherd's Stores, uh, and to listen on a crystal set that a brother of mine had built around an empty Quaker Oaks bottle uh, package. And uh, I listened to a program of poetry by a writer named Walt Whitman about a man I thought I knew who ran a candy for a, a penny a store on the corner by the name of Joe Kaplan. And uh, the poem went, Oh, Kaplan, my Kaplan, <laughs> the fearsome trip is done. And I wondered what was fearsome about a trip between Boston and East Boston. I, I were reached bar mitzvah age, before I understood that O Captain was really O Captain, <laughs> and that the captain of the poem was Abraham Lincoln, who had just been assassinated at the end of the Civil War. And that was the, the, the fearful trip with object one. I was ashamed for having uh, mistaken captain for Kaplan, and this morning period lasted into my years at USC when Marty Kaplan was appointed head of the Norman Lear Center. My awe at the name of Norman Lear was such that when I invited myself to come this evening, it was my understanding that I would be here to listen and learn like the rest of us. And, uh, and not to speak. However, that was the, not the understanding of Steve Brogdon, who is boss around here, and what he says goes. Uh, Norman Lear is a great American, but even greater than I knew from his supremacy as a pro proponent of civil liberties by reason of his service record in World War II, I learned that he was a bombardier in the American Air Force, that he flew 52 missions and lived not to flaunt to millions of fellow countrymen and women who judged him on his TV and radio record and not on his wartime missions. 
No man in American history, with the exception of Lincoln and the Founding Fathers, has worked harder to revere the Declaration of Independence. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was produced at the Skirball Center a play on the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. Here is some of what Lincoln asked and said in those debates. Are you really willing that the Declaration be frittered away? That it should be no more than an interesting memorial of the dead past? No more than old warding left to rot on the battlefield after the victory is won? Shorn of its vitality and left without even the suggestion of the individual rights of the individual rights of man in it. This business of teaching that the Declaration of Independence has nothing to do with the Negro, that its soul is a matter of dollars and credits and cents. These ideas, I say, are blowing out all the moral lights around us. Recently, we have seen the, uh, the exalting experience of seeing those moral lights re relit. I think <laughs> that the United States of America has reached maturity within the, uh, within the, the last month, and you have helped it to do to that wonderful, exalted stage. Uh, I hope that Norman will explain what he is doing to make the Declaration of Independence uh, everybody's property. And uh, Wonderful, a wonderful prospect for the future of man was and is Norman's All in the Family series. It reminds us cleverly and with high humor that civilizations which have most honored the family have in doing so honored themselves. Uh, there have been no greater authors of this condition than Norman Lear in founding a redoubtable organization called People for the American Way. And uh, Martin Kaplan, too, for as director of the Lear Center at a great American university, is an active friend a very true democratic uh, impulse in the world. Uh, I thank the friends of of um, of Norman Lear, Marvin Kaplan, and uh, Peter. And uh, Steve uh, Brogdon for my being here, and your being here, and Marty being here. And I happily turn the microphone over to Marty. Thank you, Norman. It's, uh, it's such an honor and treat for me to be uh, with uh, the two Normans that I most respect in the world uh, to, uh, uh, to do anything in your uh, uh, orbit is, is really quite uh, uh, extraordinary and inspirational. So I, I thank you for uh, dreaming up the idea of uh, this conversation here tonight. And uh, I promise not to hog the microphone. Maybe we'll have a bit of a conversation, too, if that's OK with you. Um, in the back, there is a brochure, 
which uh, if you haven't taken, I, I would be delighted if you take. Uh, it describes what the Norman Lear Center is, but uh, I'll presume you haven't read it yet and uh, tell you a little bit about it. And maybe after a while, we can also have a, a larger conversation uh, if anyone has a, a comment or a question. The, uh, the Lear Center is part of the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Southern California. Uh, it began in the year 2000, and the impulse behind it was the thought that entertainment arguably has become the most important force in not just America, but all countries on the planet. And by entertainment, what I mean is not just what a Wall Street analyst might mean about entertainment, uh, movies, radio, uh, television, and so on, but I mean something broader, which is the the need and the ability to capture and hold attention. If you ask what conventional entertainment has in common, it's that capturing of our attention. But if you think about the ways in which, for example, news has become a branch of entertainment in which we're supposed to be following along compulsively, and I suspect uh, some of you in the recent uh, run-up to the election season have, uh, you know, hit that refresh button on your computer a few too many times in, uh, in an hour and maybe watched a little more cable television than you were uh, intending to, to watch. And the politicians, in turn, were creating theater meant to attract our attention. Journalism is a f branch of entertainment in that respect because they, too, want us to pay attention. But you can go more broadly than that. Uh, what we call high culture, uh, museums and uh, uh, libraries and, and uh, the opera, I in so many ways they are trying to get audiences and to market themselves and to compete for people's time and attention in the same way that uh, a, a pop singer is, is trying to compete for our attention. Uh, universities brand and market themselves. Um, uh, religious institutions need to capture and hold their audiences and become user friendly. Uh, there, there's a way in which the, the queuing lines at Disney and the parking lots at mega churches have something in common. So the impulse of the Lear Center is to ask, what do we learn if we look at this force in modern society? Uh, is it hurting or is it helping? Can it be used as a force for good? Uh, is there a way to uh, intervene in the relationship between entertainment and ourselves? So uh, there's the bright side and the dark side. And on the dark side, I have to say that uh, of the, the books on the topic of the impact of entertainment on society, which paints the dark picture, one of the leading books in that realm is by Norman Corwin, called The Trivialization of America. And I was pleased to see uh, in the special collections uh, downstairs, uh, or, uh, across the way, there's a nice uh, exhibit case and there's a copy of The Trivialization of America uh, in that case. And, and there, Norman makes the case, uh, and this was published when, Norman, 84? Run 84, make the case that uh, we are uh, in a culture in which the small is made big and we are addicted to the small and maybe at the cost of paying attention to the big. So that's, that's a, a way of describing the downside. There was, there was another book that was published in 1984 called Amusing Ourselves to Death, which 
gives you a, a flavor of another way of, uh, at it. It was interesting. It was based on a series of lectures that were given at my school, the Annenberg School, uh, by uh, uh, a scholar named Neil Postman. And what he did was, this was 1984, which uh, was a year to conjure with. We all, uh, those of us who were in the world before 1984, were taught to look forward uh, to that year with fear because it would be the kind of authoritarian, dictatorial, uh, big brother end to democracy and civilization. And what the author of that book said was, that's not the dystopia to fear. The one to fear is Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, in which everybody is happy. Everybody is always entertained always amused and therefore are always susceptible to tyranny. So that's the dark side. The bright side is that there are many good things that entertainment can do or should do and at the Lear Center we look at both sides. So what I'd like to do is describe some of the projects we have at the Lear Center and maybe by describing them concretely, you can get a sense uh, of what we do. Uh, there are uh, a couple dozen projects, uh, about a dozen at a time are active, and uh, I'm only going to mention a few to, to get us started. One uh, is called Hollywood Health and Society. So let me uh, start describing that by telling you something which, when you hear it, May, I think will make sense to you, even if it didn't occur to you before. There are a lot of people who, when they are watching television, entertainment television, not the news, not documentaries, but series, soap operas and uh, uh, dramas and comedies, when they watch shows and someone says something which is, sounds like a fact, people believe it's true. So for example, if you're watching um, Law and Order or CSI and someone describes something about you know, chemistry or forensics or evidence, you don't think, oh, they're just making that up. You think, wasn't that clever? They took something real and they put it into the plot. Uh, this becomes tremendously important in the realm of health and medicine. There are, as I'm sure you know, 46 million people who, are, who don't have health insurance. There are many people who belong to HMOs who might say that they might as well not have health insurance. Um, but the key is that their access to information about medicine and health is relatively limited. And so when they see a show like House or Grey's Anatomy or ER and someone has symptoms and the doctor says this is what you have and here's the medicine for it, they think it's true and real and useful advice for them. What they, those people, don't know is that in many cases the writers just make the stuff up. And as a consequence, they are getting guidance for how they should behave uh, in terms of their own health from a source which is not reliable. So what the Lear Center did was we got a grant from the Centers for, for Disease Control from the federal government. We got it in the year uh, 2000 and we've got it renewed uh, every year since then. And what we do is give free advice to any television show and any movie maker that wants it. And the advice isn't from us. We connect them with the best doctors, the best researchers all around the country. So we now have a kind of hotline and an 800 number and a website where uh, we get many times a day a call from someone working on a show and the call would be something like this. Uh, we have a story where we need somebody to be sick and then the doctor thinks it's A, but it's really not A, it's B, 
and because he's prescribed medicine for A, the patient gets sicker, and then they realize it's B, and then the patient's family sues, but it turns out that what the doctor wanted to hap have happen with A worked out anyway. What's the disease and what's the cure? <laughs> and we s somehow managed to find doctors and research scientists who are willing to play along with that because they know that it's important. One of my favorite stories um, was about uh, uh, the show ER, and there was uh, an episode in which somebody had uh, cancer of the mouth. And the way the person learned that he had cancer of the mouth in the story was that during an examination, the patient was asked to stick out his tongue, and instead of it going straight out, it deviated to the side. Well, there was a woman who saw this show, and she had been having headaches and discomfort, and when she saw that symptom, she thought, wait a minute. She looked in a mirror, she stuck her tongue out, her, jaw, her tongue deviated to the side, she went straight to the emergency room, and she said to the admitting nurse, I have cancer of the mouth. And the nurse said, how do you know? She said, I saw it on ER. <laughs> well, it was a long night for her, but it turned out that, I mean, tragically, she did have mouth cancer, but uh, happily, because she knew about it, uh, they began a course of treatment, and she is well, and the Joel Sachs, who was the head writer of the show at the time, said, I never expected to save anybody's life. <laughs> but the truth is this happens over and over and over, in particular with soap operas. The people who watch soap operas uh, as a population tend to be the most vulnerable to these kinds of health issues. And so, for example, a soap opera which has the story of uh, a woman who is diagnosed with breast cancer but refuses surgery because she believes if you cut into the cancer, it will spread, which turns out to be a common belief in the African-American community. And so uh, because a storyline was done about that and we did research about this, people came to understand that surgical uh, attempts to deal with cancer are okay to do. Uh, there's a show called Numbers on Primetime, which is about uh, math, a lot of epidemiology. And they did an episode about uh, a black market in kidney transplants. And uh, the allegation in the plot was that there is a black market in kidney transplants. Turns out there isn't, but it's an urban legend. We couldn't convince the show not to do that story. But what we could do was convince them that in the last scene of that show, the two of the characters on the show said, they, sh they held up their California driver's licenses on which there was a little dot, and it said, I've become an organ donor. And because they said that in that show, based on our extensive national survey research, there was an increase in 10% of the people who were watching that show who said they were going to become organ donors because of it. So you can use entertainment, is my message from that, as a force for good uh, if you try. And so the Lear Center, that's one of about a dozen projects that we're up to. And now that project has also recently gotten a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and so we are now expanding our reach to global health issues as well. Um, I'll tell you about another project that we're up to, and this has to do with news. You, uh, if I asked you, uh, in terms of news about politics and public affairs, when people are making up their minds who to vote for, or uh, what to decide about a local issue. What is the most important source of news for them? And there are studies that have been done asking that question for the last 40 years. And you might think that the answer would be 
uh, network news or the newspaper or uh, these days cable news or the internet? The answer consistently year after year for 40 years is local television news. Now, uh, those of you who watch local television news may fear for the future of democracy. Um, what we at the Lear Center decided to do was instead of bemoaning the fate, uh, the, the quality and condition of local television news, that we would try to do something about it. So for the last eight years, we have been uh, waging maybe a rear guard effort to improve the quality of local television news, not just locally, but all around the country. And the way we do it is with a carrot and with a stick. I'll tell you about the stick first. The stick is research. Uh, it turns out that it's extremely difficult to do national research about local news. Could just think about it for a second. There are, uh, you know, a hundred media markets in the country, and each of those media markets has three to seven television stations. How are you going to record enough of that stuff in enough of those places to actually have a defensible uh, point of view about the quality of those stations? Well, we figured out how to do it. It was very expensive. We raised money to do it. Uh, in the early years, it was especially complicated because this was before all kinds of fancy technology that we now had. We had volunteers in 50 media markets all around the country, and they all had VCRs set, and they all recorded the stuff, and they were FedExing the tapes uh, back and forth across the country to us, and we had a, a squadron of researchers analyzing them round the clock. And the results of our research were, and you will not be shocked to know, that local TV news tends not to be very good. But this was the first time that anybody had the data, the statistics, in order to demonstrate that that was not just somebody's opinion, uh, but it was the consequence of doing the study. Uh, I mean, for example, you can do a, com a composite picture of what a half hour of local television news is. So uh, you will not be surprised to know that the thing that there's most is ads. And after ads is sports and weather. And after that is crime. And if you want to know how much coverage there is of politics, public issues, and public affairs, that turns out to be a teensy little slice on the pie chart all the way down at the bottom. So what we discovered, I thought I would discover that the coverage they gave of politics was not good. What I learned was they don't cover it at all. And so since then, uh, aside from bemoaning the state and you know, offering testimony to the FCC and uh, uh, trying to uh, basically shame people uh, in charge of those shows to do better, we also, on the carrot side, have been doing something else. And this goes back to the question of entertainment. Why does local television news do what it does? The answer is they think that's how you attract people. They're all about numbers. They're all about audiences. They are in the entertainment business. They're not, they don't think of themselves as being in something separate from entertainment. And so what we have tried to do is to uh, create uh, tapes which compile the best of local television news coverage of politics in order to demonstrate that when they use the same techniques that they now apply to breathlessly telling us dramatic stories about crime or cats up a tree or uh, 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 freeway chases or, or stars or sadly today, tragically, uh, 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 fires, that they can use those same storytelling talents, which are so effective on non-political stuff and apply it to politics and to public affairs. Because after all, what is uh, uh, more interesting than the drama 
of people competing against each, each other, the clash of ideas, the attempt. Uh, uh, it's it's kind of like a reality show, isn't it? You know, the, and in the end, you get to vote and decide who gets to, to win. So we have uh, conducted training workshops for uh, uh, people who are producers and correspondents, and we give out an award. Walter Cronkite allowed us to use his name, and we give out, have since the year 2000, the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Television Coverage of Politics. And so we are now receiving the entries for, for this go-round, and we honor the people who do it well in order to uh, encourage that kind of thing. So that's, that's a second example of uh, projects that we're up to. Um, I want to ask uh, Norman Corwin, because I've been talking for a little bit, um, I want to go back to the trivialization of America. Um, in the years since you wrote that, have you had reason to be at all encouraged, or is all that you've seen discouraging about what you described? All that I have seen is discouraging. Uh, uh, but then we have come through a very tense era of mistaken priorities and uh, mistaken emphases on the wrong, uh, the wrong values in America under the, under the presidency of of George Bush, we have lost ground. And I am encouraged to hear you speak because I, I, there has been proven for me that you are the right man in the right <laughs> place. And uh, I am simply enthralled by the uh, work you are doing that the Norman Lear Center is accomplishing routinely, and uh, it connects with my long-held theory that uh, a, f a society which is uh, on the key which is moving forward on a broad front, is a free society and that, that the accomplishments in terms of, of lasting value to the world are the product of countries that have freed their population uh, by a uh, respect for liberties, a respect for rights, respect for historic, uh, historically proven values, that, for example, in the, in the era of Periclean democracy in Greece, that was a great society. We had great playwrights. We had uh, wonderful architecture, wonderful sculpture, and the Greece of that period was attacked by a, a former Hitler who was Philip of Macedonia, the father of Alexander. <coughs> and uh, Demosthenes saw what was coming. He apprehended the dangers of conforming, the dangers of, of silencing uh, certain, uh, what would today be called the liberal population, so that Demosthenes was ignored when he said to Athenians, fellow Athenians, we've got to stop uh, Philip together or he will, he will consume us individually. They paid no attention to Demosthenes. Uh, they uh, suffered. And to this day, where is the Greece of the sculpture and the architecture and the 
playwrights like Euripides. I have a little story I must interpose here of a man who went to a tailor in ancient Greece to repair his trousers, which had been ripped. And the tailor said, Euripides? And, and he said, yes, Eumenides? Well, it's, it's a little story uh, that illustrates the awareness of even tailors in ancient Greece. <laughs> and uh, think of the tyrannies, the modern tyrannies that we've lived through. Japan and Germany and Italy and the fascist countries, we fought them. They cost us a lot of blood and treasure. We defeated them. But what has happened? There is a stubborn quality, and it is usually expressed by the artists of the country, by the sculptors, today by the filmmakers. Japan, in spite of its, of its uh, censorship and its cruel, inhuman, uh, fascist wars, uh, is, a, is a responsible country. They made great films during the war, and it is, it is the artist who carries the burden and carries it bravely and carries it unassumingly. And uh, I think that the Norman Lear Center typifies that quality. And Norman Lear, in his life and work, typifies that quality, a stubborn tenacity for the rights of man. Uh, we must not overlook that, that uh, quantity, that element in human behavior. And I think that what you are doing, Marty, and what Norman is doing is exemplary. And uh, I say, as a man close to, close to the end of my life, I'm 98 and a half, uh, that I have a, a good feeling about the future that is in good custodial hands and uh, the fact that a university as rich and powerful as, as Southern California, which uh, each week receives million dollars, millions of dollars of endowment, uh, has the good sense to invite Norman Lear to lend his name and the power of his, of his philosophy to the Norman Lear Center and the good taste and judgment to engage you, Marty, as its director. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, take your invitation up earlier to describe some of what Norman Lear himself is up to. Um, uh, the Lear Center occasionally works with Norman Lear uh, on some of his projects, and uh, uh, one of them that we've had the privilege to be involved with uh, has to do with the Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, Mr. Lear and his wife uh, bought the only copy of the Declaration of Independence to come up for sale. This is uh, not the one that you know with the signatures at the bottom. That was done later. 
the one that was done the night of our country's birthday, on July 4th, 1776, uh, after the uh, Continental Congress said, yes, we approve the language, uh, Jefferson and Franklin went uh, two blocks away to the printing shop of John Dunlop and they printed out a bunch of copies because, of course, how were they going to tell all their fellow revolutionaries that they had declared their independence? And so they printed out about 500 copies and they dispatched uh, riders all over the colonies who took days to get to the, the far reaches and then the declaration was read out loud. And so uh, this printing, the Dunlop Broadside, it's called, uh, uh, only, I think I have this right, 24 copies were known to exist uh, into uh, contemporary times. But then somebody in Pennsylvania found uh, a flea shop uh, picture frame had something hiding behind it and it was a Dunlop broadside. So it came onto the market and uh, Norman and Lynn Lear purchased it. And the reason they did was to give it back to the country. And the purpose that uh, Norman uh, came to for the use of this was not just to send something around to be worshiped, but instead to figure out how it could be used to encourage people, especially young people, to be involved to be in civic engagement, to vote, uh, to, to let their voices be heard, to be informed. And so uh, there began uh, a many year effort at first called the Declaration of Independence Road Trip and then Declare Yourself. And what it used more than anything else were the techniques of entertainment in order to get people to come. A very splashy, exciting, uh, a traveling uh, kind of a tent show uh, with uh, posters and uh, uh, interesting stuff for families to come see that would move around with a copy of the Declaration. And there were uh, poets and singers and uh, all kinds of reasons for people to turn up in all these cities. And then while they were there, there were uh, people with uh, tables and voter registration forms and, and ways to translate that into engagement. Plus, uh, Norman had the understanding that uh, the way to reach young people is not to drag them someplace they're not, but to go where they are. And so, uh, through the use of entertainers who are very influential to young people, uh, and through the internet and through all the other kinds of modern entertainment technology to, and comedy and uh, very funny and clever things and, and uh, uh, poetry slams and all kinds of other stuff that uh, uh, Norman, who is 86, knew a lot more about than any of us who were half his age or younger. Um, he was able, in the course of this effort, uh, to bring about, uh, I think I have this right, the voter, uh, re two million young people to register to vote in this past presidential election, which is an amazing accomplishment. And it was done by slyly using the techniques and, and material of entertainment to get people engaged uh, in their worlds. Um, uh, I want to mention uh, a couple of other Lear Center projects and then maybe we'll open up for, for questions. Uh, uh, another project that we got involved in, uh, you may be interested in, uh, we called The Tyranny of 18 to 49. And what that's about is something that is extremely common in uh, the television industry. Uh, you may have heard the expression, the desirable demographic, uh, the ones that the advertisers most want to get, the one that you pay a premium for. And sometimes it's called 18 to tw uh, 29, 18 to 34, 18 to, to 49. But the conventional wisdom is those are the people who have money, those are the people who want to uh, uh, 
try different brands. Those are the ideal targets of advertisers. And what we asked ourselves is, is that true? And so we did a lot of empirical research. And it turns out there is no basis for saying that the people who are in that age bracket are the people who have money to spend on stuff, are the people who are willing to uh, uh, try new brands. The, the reason that that came about was in the early 80s, CBS was having a terrible season. And uh, someone in the CBS research staff discovered that the only way you could call CBS number one was if you only looked at people 18 to 34. And so they announced, we're number one in the desirable 18 to 34 demographic. And we're going to charge advertisers a premium for it. And amazingly, no one stopped to ask, is this true? Well, as it turns out, we did a, 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 re a conference and uh, we had someone from the AARP there who pointed out that the most disposable income is not in that group. That in fact, people do not stay loyal. Do you only buy the same kind of toothpaste when you go to the market? Of course not. You try, you're interested in what's going on. And so this mythology, uh, permeated the industry. And so what we tried to do was uh, uh, to mount a, a, a rear guard effort to convince the people who choose programming and the people who work with advertisers that it's nuts only to provide programming for people in that allegedly desirable demographic. That advertisers really want to reach everybody, not just those people. And uh, we, may, we may not have succeeded, but I was delighted to at least uh, make a dent in that. Um, one other uh, project uh, to tell you about, we've been doing a survey uh, recently, uh, in the last couple of years, with a polling firm called uh, Zogby. You may have heard about it. Um, it's a national survey, and uh, uh, they go to four or 5,000 people when they do it. And what we've been trying to do is figure out whether there is a correlation between people's political values and their tastes in entertainment. And the answer is yes. Uh, what we discovered was that you can, uh, this will not be a surprise, you can divide the country into uh, you know, clusters which are one side, the other side, and the middle. Uh, politically. But what was very interesting was that each of those clusters was also well defined in terms of what kind of entertainment they liked, what they did in their leisure time, even what kind of music they preferred or food they, they liked to eat. And so we've been doing a series of reports on this uh, in order to uh, paint the picture of uh, the country, not just in political terms, but in the entertainment clusters that, that go with it. Uh, the first version of that study was, tell me what you watch and listen to and read, and I'll tell you who you vote for. And it turns out not to be far off. You can almost do a kind of quiz and give people a list of which, which of these things do you like, and at the end you can score it and say, I bet you are uh, a liberal, conservative, moderate uh, uh, swing voter, and so on. So uh, uh, we've, we've done that, and we also, uh, uh, in particular, we published a report uh, this summer after the political conventions called Meet the Purples. And the purples are the people, you know, there's the red states and blue states. Well, the fight in politics is for the people in between, the undecideds. That we call them the purples, and so we did the most intense portrait of what the purples are like, inviting any candidate to read this stuff and realize if you want to reach these people, here's what they're watching on television. Here, here are the things that they buy. Here's how they spend their leisure time in order, in order to reach them. I don't know if we made a difference in the election, but at least uh, we did manage to, to get the first description of that out on the record. So let me ask you if you have a, a question or a comment for, for Norman or for me. Yes. 
I have more actually of a, of a statement. Um, about 25 years ago, I was a young, bright-eyed journalism student at the University of Southern California, and you, Mr. Corwin, were my professor. <laughs> and so when I saw that you were coming in the paper, um, I brought my two young sons, 14 and 17, on his way to college next year. And I just want to thank you, because so many times in my life, I've been told what a wonderful gift I have for writing. And one of the things I remember you always stress to us in your class was, just write. doesn't matter what you write, just write. So I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to see you and looking so wonderful. And um, thank you so much. I am encouraged by what I hear tonight from Marty and from you. And uh, I, I reflect that six months ago, I was in despair. I thought we were going to re-elect Republicans <laughs> after their show. And uh, I would uh, go to bed at night thinking this is a country whose most popular television is, is te uh, uh, television wrestling. <laughs> and uh, that is not a, an intellectual sport that I recommend. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, have had the, <laughs> I have had the experience of receiving letters in praise of my work that were better written than my work. <laughs> and uh, this is a, a great country capable of resources and capable of insult and capable of discerning an insult as they did in the last week of the current, of the recent campaign. They were insulted by the $700 billion uh, mess that was inflicted on us by Wall Street. And uh, that, I think, the economy uh, was perceived by the general public and that was an easy victory for Obama, not a close one. Uh, even, even though Montana isn't decided yet. Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> Minnesota. Uh, I believe in America that it has great talents, that it has always been uh, for a young country to have given us Hawthorne and Whitman and, and uh, uh, Emerson and uh, the modern writers who are good. They're good, they're, they're good writers. We, writers, we should be proud of them. And we should be proud of what is going on and you should be proud of being here tonight because you are the uh, populace upon which uh, ideas like the Lear philosophy and the Kaplan mm -hmm. philosophy take root and, and are developed and spread. And uh, what begins quietly can become national and we have only we have our history to prove that that out of Boston should come the United States of America ultimately ultimately and it was uh, we have only to read about those giants of American history uh, the forefathers, never has a country been established by intellectuals, by a group of smart radicals gathered in in one Philadelphia, people who had a concern about independence, who had a concern about the menace of slavery, who the central event of American life 
was the civil war and what country before us has shed blood and treasure to get rid of a menace like slavery. Americans have much to be proud of and uh, I don't mean the, the we have certainly dross, we have uh, pools of ignorance that are deep, but we also have the capacity to recognize the artists in our society, to elevate Norman Lear to the position that he holds today, to make the Lear Center a viable and powerful institution that can only help us grow and which is uh, a, a, an ideal for the future to aim at, to keep current and alive and puissant in American affairs. We are a great country and we know we owe no other country an apology for that. We are a greatness that was uh, native and which came out of, I'm sure, out of the diversity of the American population. We are the only country which in the in the great words of 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 the Statue of Liberty uh, accommodated the rejected from the old royal uh, nations of Europe and Asia. People who fled and were, were fled for an ideal not yet formed in their own minds, but an instinct for liberty. We have it, animals have it. You try to trap certain animals and it's a hard job. And I am also, I'm always a cheerleader for the animal. <laughs> and uh, uh, we are interesting, puissant, able, inventive people. And we should be proud of that and never let the, the statistics of the popular forms of, radio, of television, of a medium, defeat us. I remember one day I was teaching at Island World a mountain community where people go in the summer. And I had a standing order for the Los Angeles Times every morning. And I would pick up and go to town from the outskirts, which outnumber the inskirts of, of that area. And I would pick up my paper. And one day, <coughs> There was no paper to pick up because the demand for the morning paper had been so tremendous that it could not be withheld. And that was because it carried the news of the death of, uh, of uh, what's the name of the singer who, who enlisted his pelvis. As, Elvis. As, uh, he had died, and that, that was the tremendous force that upset the literary ha habits of that town for that day. But it was over by the, by the end of the weekend, and we were back to normal, and American normal is very good. It's, uh, it's what makes you enraptured to return home.
after a trip abroad, even to the most enlightened countries of the world. Go to France and you'll be glad to be home. <laughs> Any other? Yes. Has any of your research shown um, American class systems being redefined and, and values possibly changing, mainstream values changing? Um, I don't think I know enough to, uh, to answer that question. Um, there's a, a little subset of that question that I have looked into which is uh, uh, a kind of, I guess it's a thing that creates American values, and that's American intelligence. Um, the question of, uh, are we as a country uh, smarter or less smart now than we used to be? And does it have anything to do with uh, entertainment? And uh, what I found was that ever since people began uh, surveys or writing about this topic, they were bemoaning the decline in American intelligence, that it's never been as bad as it is today, and that today has changed uh, uh, and moved forward for, for all of these, uh, uh, at least going back a century. Um, uh, the, it, it's hard to do comparisons of standard tests like uh, military entrance exams and college boards and so on to try to figure out if in fact we have declined in intelligence. Uh, but what I have found is that we always think that we're on the brink of a new age of ignorance. <laughs> um, one, one interesting study which I, I'm fond of uh, referring to has to do with, um, I, I mentioned earlier that local television news is the most popular source of local news. Uh, across the board. But as, as you probably know, uh, in recent years there has been a surge in uh, interest, especially among younger people, in comedy, political comedy on television. The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, these are very popular shows. So the Pew Charitable Trust did an interesting study a couple of years ago. They uh, asked people what their number one source of news was. And then they also gave them a current events quiz. They asked them things like, you know, Putin is the head of what country? That kind of thing. They asked them 20 questions. And then they tried to correlate, and they did correlate, between how people, how well people or poorly they did on the current events test with what they watched. And what they discovered was that the people who did the worst on the current events tests were the people who said their number one source of news was local television news. The people who did the best said that The Daily Show and Colbert was their number one source. And so that's what that demonstrates is that people are not just getting attitude from their shows, they're actually learning things which show up when you do a current events test. Yes? We were talking about the perception people have when they watch uh, fiction on, on television, ER and programs like that. Can you talk about the effect, uh, either one of uh, the gentlemen, the effect that demagoguery on television and radio, such as the Sean Hannity's and on the left, the Keith Olbermann's, how that affects people's uh, perceptions also? Norman, are, are you uh, someone who w w permits yourself to watch television demagoguery? Uh, I am a student of demagoguery. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I am a practitioner of demagoguery <laughs> at, at times, but I, w listening to you just now, and this gentleman's question, I want to come up with a, a question of my own. How many foreign countries have given us writers of the stature of Mark Twain? How many? A world figure, an American figure, very much an American figure. And uh, we have all about us wonderful people, great talents. And they, they write you letters, they work for you, they, they run for office, 
and they write theses, and uh, I respect them. And uh, much is much scoffing is done about the high high domed intellectuals and professors, but we need them, and uh, I get uh, I have a an Apple computer, and it's the traffic of commentary from the school to which I have am aligned, USC, is enormous. It's like Wilshire Boulevard and, and uh, Westwood Boulevard, the corner of that all day long. Uh, people are eager for information. People contribute information. There are even uh, uh, even uh, invitations to radio and television listeners. Call the station if you come across anything interesting that will interest your fellow Angelinos. And that's that's healthy. That's a healthy currency. I don't think that in the Soviet former Soviet Union, I don't think that in Russia or Japan there's anybody saying, call the station. <laughs> <laughs> but there is in this country, in this, uh, this city. And uh, I have a helper who's here tonight who awakens me in the morning by turning on my television set and there I am, the world is up and about. And I am made to understand the progress or lack of progress made in the last 24 hours. And I am, I am happy that this uh, new spirit is uh, manifest today before I step into the shadows. And uh, I will say, I, even though I might die tomorrow and the country is in a turmoil, economically, I feel better about it. Uh, last question, I think we probably have to get to the refreshments. Yes, sir. Well, I was uh, hoping to hear a bit more about radio drama tonight. And I do want to tell you that uh, when I grew up, I listened to the radio, and I heard uh, dramatizations of every major classics, The Three Musketeers, Shakespeare. I heard radio drama giving me these, this information, and, and information about a lot of current uh, things, you know. I, uh, at an early age, I even learned that Africa was a continent. <laughs> so I wonder if, you know, Mr. Corbin would have any hopes for the future of radio drama. Well, never is a long time. And those who say that never will we have a return of the, of the spirit that welcomed radio drama in the sense that we both would make both of us happy, uh, I dare not say that it will never return. I hope it will return. I hope that people will get tired of certain things that I don't care about and will return to things I do care about. <laughs> and uh, so that's what you have expressed in your question, I think. Will there be a return of things we care about? And I think there will. It's a big, diverse, muscular country, and uh, it is not to be denied. It is built on its lack of conformity. On It is built, it was engineered by some radicals in the colonial days who acknowledged that they must all hang together or they will hang separately. <laughs> and that, that they 
stood in, that they understood when they were meeting in Philadelphia and signing their names to what could easily have been their death warrant. Each, each, man, each signer of the declaration was a, a traitor to a royal society which condoned slavery, which condoned unfair taxation. That was the principle. Can you imagine a revolutionary spirit in this country today about taxes? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Washington, where is Washington when we need him? Anyway, I thank you. I thank Steve uh, Brogdon for making this evening possible, and I thank Norman and Martin for being among you who have been influenced by them and will continue to be influenced by them for the good. Thank you so much. Please join us for refreshments in the library. Thank you very much.